Welcome to Foolproof Theology. My name is Chase Davis and I'm your host. It's great to be with you here today. Hey, if you're not a Patreon supporter, you need to sign up today. Get in there and cause some ruckus. Get in there, ask me good questions, give me good show prompts. Uh, happy to interact. You can sign up in the show notes. I got a link down there and I'd love for you to kind of join the team for Foolproof Theology. Today on the show, we have a returning guest, Colin Redimer. He's a professor out at St. Mary's and also connected with the Davenant Institute. Colin, thanks so much for coming back on the show today. Great to be here, Chase. Am I your first returning guest? No, no, no. You're not that special. We've oh, we've had man. several. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, one of the few, but yeah. If I make it back you... for round three, will I be uh, will I be in rare yes. more rarefied territory? Okay, excellent. That will awesome. be more rare as long as you keep making books that that are very interesting to me. Deal. And I'll keep having you on. So Sounds you keep good. doing doing what you do. Um, one of the works that we're going to talk about today, really the main one is a book called Christian Ethics by Thomas Traherne. And I think we're going to butcher the pronunciation of his last name constantly throughout the episode. Probably not you, but me. And so I wanted to talk about that book. So it's in a dead to... language, Chase. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. Yeah. Is it really a dead language? <laughs> no. I was like, it's, it's written from, in English. It's from England. <laughs> <laughs> so Thomas Traherne, 1637 to 1675. Episcopalian, maybe Puritan, probably so. Tell me and give my audience a, a brief kind of overview of who this guy is, what this works about. Yeah, Thomas Traherne was a, you know, the, the, the child of just, you know, your average working class family in, uh, in England, born around the time of the English Civil War, uh, you know, 1600s. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, stood out from the crowd of the average people. We, we, we suspect he was a cobbler's son. Uh, when I first started this project, I had an initial conversation with somebody where they said, Oh, so you're going to do work on this, uh, Christian ethics by Thomas Turn, you know, when, when did he live? And I was like, I don't know, sometime in the 1600s. They're like, where? And I was like, ah, somewhere in England. And they were like, those are the things you're going to have to have an answer to. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, the, the funny thing is because he was such a commoner, we having now gone into the scholarly literature and like actually researched it, like, there are basic things we don't know. When exactly was he born? Where exactly was he born? You know, these are things about which scholars just do disagree. And, and there's probably never going to be a definitive answer because, because again, he was a commoner, but for whatever reason, he got an education and, and was sort of selected from his community to go get an education, was educated at Oxford at Brasnose college. Maybe it's Brasnose, maybe it's Brasnose. I don't know. You know, this is again, this is like not, this is a different country we're talking about here. Sure. Um, and, um, and, you know, he, he was, uh, educated during, uh, Cromwell's protectorate. And so Lord Cromwell was the, the Puritan who, um, you know, under his, under his leadership, they won the English civil war. They deposed the King. Um, they founded a, a Puritan nation in the United Kingdom. And not just in England, but also sort of ruling over Scotland and Wales and, and Northern Ireland. Uh, and then, and dur it was during that actually that, that Traherne was at Oxford. Um, Oxford, of course, was a little bit more uh, leaned towards being royalist. So they were more towards the crown, less puritanical than Cambridge, which also existed at the time and, and leaned more towards the Puritans. But of the colleges at Oxford, Brasenose was the the center of the more Puritan leanings. So they were sort of counter signaling right inside the Royalist uh, community. And that was where he got his education. He doesn't, we don't really have much of his writing from that period. Uh, we have some notes that he took when he was studying, you know, Francis Bacon and, and whatnot, but we don't have like, he doesn't write letters to people where he's like, here's what I think. I'm actually an Anglican. Um, he, he graduates and decides to go into the pastorate. He, he gets back home and gets a, pastorate at Creedon Hill gets uh, ordained, but it's, and it's kind of tricky, right? Because I think the American listeners, we tend to think that, you know, we look back into history and we think there's Puritans and the Puritan church, and there's like Anglicans and the Anglican church. But like the Anglican church didn't really exist at, at that point. There was just the church of England. There was the church in England. And, um, you know, many of those churches were Puritan leaning, right? They had Puritan convictions. The Church of England has many Puritans inside of it. And, and similarly, um, you know, Traherne gets ordained, 
but it's not an Episcopal ordination. The bishop doesn't come and ordain him. He doesn't go through the rite as the Church of England would want it to, even though he was pastoring over a Church of England church. So you, you have these really weird phenomenon. Once uh, Cromwell gets overthrown, they reestablish the monarchy. Um, at that point, you know, without any explanation, he does end up getting an Episcopal ordination. So he's ordained twice. So this is like for all the all the listeners out there who've you know been baptized as an infant and then they like go to some hot dog church and they, you know, ask right. to be <laughs> this <laughs> guy right here <laughs> baptized the second time. <laughs> it's like you know this doesn't quite fit good theological reasoning, uh, you know, either for baptism or ordination. And yet these are phenomenon that, that are old. They, they predate the contemporary American situation for, for reasons that we could go into. Um, you know, while he's, while he's there, he's also studying at Oxford. So he's getting an, another advanced degree, he keeps studying, keeps, keeps going and getting, um, educated and, uh, eventually, you know, writes his first and really his only book that he publishes in his lifetime and that's uh, on Roman forgeries. So it's not even this book. It's right. it's a polemical tract against the Roman Catholic Church. So it was like, he didn't know if he was going to be a Puritan or if he was going to be an Anglican, but he knew he wasn't going to be a Roman Catholic. So I think he fits the the kind of magisterial Protestant vision that we have at the Davenant Institute, where we want to look at Protestantism as a, a thing that really does hang together um, and can kind of intermingle in a way that it doesn't quite fit with the way Roman Catholics do their theology. Um, he publishes that book, gets a, gets a promotion at some point and becomes the personal chaplain of the Lord protector who it would be like the hard to, hard to say exactly what the analogy would be today, but like, you know, secretary of state or secretary of the treasury, he's, okay. he's sort of the chaplain to a very important political figure moves to London, spends the rest of his life there serving at a church uh, in London and, and serving his patron and part of what the patron wants him to do is write a book of ethics for the people of England. So he writes on Christian ethics, which is his sort of masterpiece. He had published some pseudonymous things, which we find out later. He'd written a lot of poetry and, and some meditative stuff that never got published. He finishes Christian ethics, sends it to the publisher and dies. Mm. And his patron dies too. The publisher publishes it. But of course, you know, the publishing industry being what it is then as and as now if you're dead and your book is just kind of sitting there on amazon like no one's talking about it you're you're sort of right. unknown it, it's a kind of languishing classic um it, it has a few readers but but not really much the, then you have to fast forward because the question is like how do we even know who this guy is and sure the the solution to the story which and this is all stuff that i get into in the introduction so you can you can see it there and you can kind of follow the footnotes if you're more of a geek and you want to like look at primary sources and manuscripts at the bodleian library or whatever but he um he basically you know drifts into obscurity hundreds of years later it's like the end of the 1800s <clears throat> there's a guy who's at a used bookstore to, to kind of put it in the parlance of our times he sees some stuff in the bargain bin and his story, which this is actually contested, and, and I think is probably an, an embellishment. I think it's untrue. But his story is, it was in the bargain bin and was going to be thrown out and burned if they if it wasn't purchased that day. So he bought it for like a dollar. Um, they don't know whose it is. They're, it's sort of handwritten. They're trying to figure out what is this manuscript we're looking at? Who wrote this thing? They, they think it might be William Vaughn because there are some lines of poetry inside of it. Thomas Traherne had a way of, of sort of injecting poetry inside of his prose. And, uh, and William Vaughn was one of the metaphysical poets, kind of, a, you know, like John Donne was the one that your listeners are probably most likely to be familiar with. Eventually they, they figure it's not him. Uh, and then they find in one of those pseudonymously written works, they find a poem that matches some of the poetry in this manuscript. And they see in that a dedication to the Lord Protector. They look up his records, realize that he was the patron of this guy, Thomas Traherne. Then they go back and find Christian Ethics and these other books and realize this is the same guy. And at that point, this is right at the beginning of the 1900s, uh, they, they put out an edition of his works. And it's not these works, it's those manuscripts, right? They decide to publish them. And that becomes the Centuries of Meditations, okay. which is his sort of meditative work. Uh, it's kind of like personal devotional material and his poetry and that stuff takes off in the 1920s really through the 40s there's kind of a hot like uh 
era of Traherne studies. And, uh, and folks like Dorothy Sayers and, and C.S. Lewis really fell in love with those writings. Um, and so, you know, if you go read C.S. Lewis's letters, people who write him letters and ask him, what else should I be reading? I love your work. One of the two people who he almost universally sends him to, he's like, you've got to read Thomas Traherne. Really? So if you're a Lewis nut, you really should be reading Thomas Traherne. Yeah. And, and our goal here is to go back to that masterpiece that was like Traherne's life's work, right? His masterpiece that, yeah. that isn't really as well known. How can we modernize that? Can we get it out into people's hands? Can we, can we make it something that's more accessible for the average American reader? That makes complete sense. Yeah. And, you know, doing my own work in the 17th century, it's, uh, it's quite a feat to like read the, the primary sources and uh, write it with contemporary language while still honoring the text. I did notice one of the choices in the book was to uh, to use, I believe, the ASV, the American Standard Version, um, in this kind of refreshed edition of Christian Ethics. Did was this just a when you do that kind of work? Is it like you're taking whatever Bible reference he uses and you're just copy paste ASV into it to re copy replace, or how does that look? Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of how how it's actually done, yeah, I mean, it's all done on a computer now. It's uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but the, I mean, the the one thing that's that's interesting is most of the time, you know, Traherne, like many writers in his era, you see this in John Milton and other people. They're not there's no, they're not using quotation marks because oh. the presumption is the Bible's so familiar to everybody that right. would be reading this that like I don't need to. It, it's like a little bit when Jesus. Um, in, in Greek, I think it's Matthew 19, but I could, I could get this wrong. When he says, uh, you know, they ask him about divorce and he says, you know, uh, as it says in the beginning, and he tells them about what it says in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 about men and, and women, right? He's like, you're going to be joined to your father. Mother. You're going to leave your father and mother, be joined to your wife. Uh, the two will become one flesh. He's sort of, he's drawing from these things and quoting it, but it's not in quotation marks. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that actually, even just for a Bible translator is a real question. Like, do we, do we put that in quotes? Do we not put right. it in quotes? It's not in quotes in the Greek manuscript. Do we put it just as a footnote? I think it's a very similar, a similar question. Um, and some places you can identify this is definitely a quote. Some places you're like, I don't know. I think, you know, this is, and, and he's doing that not only with that, but, but we assume actually with other texts too, but it's harder to track down. So there's a, just, just like one example, you've got my head spinning from the project, but like there's one scholar who I, I am very convinced by. Most people don't think of Thomas Traherne as a Thomist. Um, in my introduction, I make what I would say is a sort of moderate case that he is, uh, or at the very least that he's very influenced by Thomas. And I've become convinced of this because there's this one uh, reader of his from, from about 100 years ago who identified and went side by side the Christian ethics and Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologia and found paragraphs, like whole paragraphs that are not quite word for word, but it's it's not clear that he's not just translating this from the Latin into right. like English of his era and changing a few words, but not citing it. And so, you know, what do you do with that? Is this like, is this a quote? Is it a paraphrase? I don't, yeah. I'm not going to get hung up on like, you know, he's plagiarizing or whatever. Like it just it doesn't matter. Sure. He's trying to help you think through it, right? Yeah, for sure. What kind of, I guess one of my questions was, uh, just as I do my own research, what version of the Bible were, was Thomas Traherne most familiar with? If he's quoting or, or just using scripture, uh, which, which version would he have been using? Was it a Geneva Bible? Um, is there any indication uh, during that time period what he would have been using? I don't know. This is a really good question, and I'm like actively... I can see you researching right now. <laughs> I'm like, how can I how can I answer this question competently? Um, you know, I I would I would assume what, when the K, the KJV comes out in sixteen twenty. So okay. six, it was completed in sixteen eleven. Um, so you know, I, what he's using. Yeah, and like the and the KJV right has has Bibles that it is drawing from. Like I think it's drawing from Wycliffe and a number of others on the other hand you know we know that thomas learned his languages and so I, I suspect even if he is dealing with a translation that's being used in a liturgical setting right um you know he he's also going back to primary sources 
Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, he's having having had multiple advanced degrees from Oxford at that point. It's like you couldn't have done that if you couldn't read. Right. You know, right. It really puts us to shame today. Is like because I uh, I took Greek and Hebrew and all that and Latin, but I've forgotten most of it. But back then they were just so well versed. I mean, this was everything they did. This was like yeah. they were so brilliant. And uh, and so yeah. I, I'm just always stunned by how uh, competent they were. I mean, the quote, and, and part of it is they just start sooner, right? So, like, the the, the thing that I like to point out is that uh, William Shakespeare went to a school when he was in, like, middle school, high school, where you couldn't speak in English on the playground. Right. It's like right. during playground time, you're still speaking Latin to one another. Yeah. It's like, well, that's why they're so good at Latin, you know? No kidding. No <laughs> kidding. Well, I, I really enjoy this book. It's relatively short. I mean, if somebody wanted to plow through it in a day, they could. Um, but it's written in such a way that you can really understand it. It's broken down. Um, it's it's very, like, pithy, um, punchy. Not punchy in, like, a, a bad way, but just, like, digestible. Um, it's, like, 100 pages. And so one of the big topics, I mean, it's Christian ethics. I, I like to say that it respects my reader's time. You know? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's why I wrote a short book is because I was just trying to respect my reader's time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we talk about ethics and you mentioned in your intro to the book, virtue ethics. So I did at least want to briefly touch on that topic. When we talk about virtue ethics and its Aristotelian kind of origins, what are we talking about and how is it different than how we might think of ethics today? Yeah, really helpful question. Um you know, I mean, the first thing to say, which which if people are not familiar with the work of the Davenant Institute, they, they should be, you know, we're, we're trying to help people recognize the variety of the sources that Protestants can draw from as they go about doing their things that are obviously predate the Protestant Roman Catholic split, you know, the Reformation. Um, uh, but also, you know, even right at that inception, I mean, there's more stuff written about Aristotle's ethical system by Protestants in the first hundred years of Protestantism, then there are Catholic works written about Aristotle's ethical system. So the first thing wow. you need to know is like virtue ethics is part of your tradition. If you're a Protestant, yeah, this is something that you are allowed to do. And, you know, almost nobody would have ever disagreed about that nowadays because of a few hundred years of, of the enlightenment and, and the impact that I think, you know, contemporary discourse around ethics has given us, we tend to think of ethics in one of two ways. One would be what we might call, de if you're looking for technical language, deontological ethics. This is like Kantian, divine command theory. You know, these are all a bit different versions of the same thing. I'm very amenable to think thinking in this way. I, I can, you know, I can do ontology with, with the best of them. And, uh, and, and I can sort of even think about how Aristotle's system could be considered a deontological in a certain sense. But this is like... This is like the, the, the simple way that this gets boiled down is thinking about ethics in terms of like rules, okay. like the 10 commandments, um, the, you know, or, or when I'm talking to more secular audiences, I'll say, look, you, you might not like the 10 commandments, but I bet you like the do's and don'ts of like how to treat people during COVID, like wash, yep. do wash your hands. Don't, you know, yep. uh, don't touch your nose or whatever. Every, sure. every, every culture comes up with these lists. Um, but these lists always seem sort of in, insufficient uh as as like guides to ethical behavior because we can all think of somebody who like does all the things they're supposed to do or doesn't do the things they're not supposed to do and is still kind of a jerk and yeah. uh and it doesn't like it doesn't resolve certain like inner problems and um and so we we think of ethics as this discipline uh and and it's a discipline with like warring factions so if that's one faction another faction is like utilitarianism how do we maximize you know the the greatest good for the greatest number of people um, you know, set aside the fact that like anyone who's taken basic calculus knows that you can't maximize two variables simultaneously. Uh, so let's just like set that critique aside and, and look at, you know, other problems with it. Like one thing with it is utilitarianism doesn't really treat humans as agents. Mm. And so the, the experience of being a human is not the experience of something which is hoping something else maximizes it or like maximizes for it. Like that's just not what it is, you know? So right. it's a very abstracted kind of robotic way of trying to think about human life. Um, it's like the, if, if the, if the like rubber meeting the road for deontological ethics is like COVID lists of do's, do's and don'ts, you know, mm -hmm. the, the rubber meeting the road version of utilitarianism is, um, 
is like, have you read the book Nudge? No. It's like, it's this, it's this social and governmental theory that's like, you know, what the government should really be doing is just trying to like nudge people to do the right things. Like, don't that's tell them, don't that. teach them, you know, just like, just, just nudge them, you know, make, make, yeah. make the garbage cans in your town bright blue so that people are more like, and they're statistically, they're more likely to throw things away. Everything will just get a little bit better kind of imperceptibly. Sure. Rather than treating humans as agents who have to make choices. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and who, for whom the choices of which are more important on an internal sense, maybe than they are in an external sense, even right. That the choices yeah. I make are sort of formational in my life. So virtue ethics says, uh, shake the etch sketch ethics. Isn't about either of those things. And, and in the point at which Aristotle was writing, it would have just been called ethics. So virtue sure. is not even, a. I mean, he talks about virtue and he talks about ethics, but virtue ethics is not like a sub discipline of the category of ethics. It's just ethics. Um, yep. It, it's a way of talking about morality, which doesn't want to draw a distinction between uh, what is good and what is exceptional. And so, you know, it really is about, you know, the, the word for, uh, for virtue that we translate into virtue comes to us from Latin ver, which is like man, manliness. And it, of course, Aristotle didn't write in Latin. He's writing in Greek. And the word there is arete, which just means excellence. Mm. So you have to think of it in terms of like for Aristotle, when he's talking about ethics, he's talking about excellence. And you can talk about the excellence of, you know, a basset hound. I have a pretty excellent basset hound. What is it to be an excellent basset hound? It's like to lie there, sleep 20 hours a day, you know, <laughs> uh, eat, you know, scare off intruders when necessary. Yeah, But like, if that's all uh, my son did with his life, I'd be like, I mean, I would never want to look at my son and say you're a failure. Um, sure. But, but he's not, he's not living this ex excellence. That's right. I'd be like, you are failing to be excellent. You know, there's, yeah. there's certain excellences which you have. And so for humans, right, the distinguishing feature is that we have, a, we have a rational mind. And so Aristotle wants to sort of think through human excellence in all the ways which would pertain to, to animal life he wants you to have a healthy body. He wants you to exercise. You know, he thinks the soul is the form of the body. These things are sort of integrally connected for him in a way that they might not be for, you know, a Cartesian, somebody who follows Descartes, but uh, also what is excellence relative to the mind, which is the distinguishing feature of humanity. Um, and so uh, that's, that's the kind of virtue ethics tradition. And what you see with Traherne, which I think is why there's a lot of overlap between himself and, and what Aquinas is up to is that Traherne is like Aquinas looking at Aristotle saying Aristotle was onto something with his account of ethics and the Nicomachean ethics and the Eudamian ethics. What is it that Christianity adds to this? What is it that we know about human excellence in light of the revelation of God in scripture? And, uh, and that's how you get, um, you know, his, his work of Christian ethics and him trying to think this stuff through for people in his time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to read an excerpt just from the intro, um, or his intro, not necessarily yours. But I mean, right off the top, he says, the goal of this work is not to entertain you, but to elevate your soul, to refine your soul's understanding and form its judgment and polish it for conversation, to purify and inflame the heart, to enrich the mind, and to guide men that stand in need of help in the way of virtue. And it will do this not by fasting with a long face, but by exciting men's desire, encouraging them to travel, comforting them in the journey, and so at last to lead them to true happiness, both here and after death. And I just found that a really compelling way to kind of set the stage uh, when a lot of our uh, kind of modern discourse around ethics or what's right or wrong or even virtue is is very entertaining and utilitarian and, you know, uh, you're going to live a good life by making a lot of money. Um, you'll see these influencers on Instagram, uh, you know, promoting wealth. Uh, if you want to be a good man, make a lot of money, you know, be, uh, assert yourself, all that kind of stuff. But I, I just think this is a beautiful way to do it. it. It seems to me when I was reading a bit through the work was Traherne puts a big emphasis on love. And so I wanted to talk about how Traherne understands love. What, what does he, how does he emphasize the importance of love in virtue? 
Yeah, I mean, great, great question. So, you know, this is the first, I, I'm modernizing it in four volumes. And so it's only, you know, this is only like 120 pages, like you said, but it's because, you know, if you do a 400 page modernization, people are probably less interested in it in a certain sense. And, right. And, and I think the average reader, even if I modernized it, don't have the intellectual training and formation to even kind of understand what it is. So there's also like a work of translation that I'm trying to do in the introduction. In the introduction to the second volume, which should come out uh, this October, um, I I am writing about him as an ethicist, and so his place in ethics. And we've already talked just a bit about that, and I kind of mention it in this introduction, which is mostly like introducing you to who this dude is. Right. Um, in my introduction to the to the fourth volume, I already have them all mapped out in my mind. I just haven't written them yet. I'm gonna mostly just talk about love. And gotcha. uh, so this is good. Like, I'm happy to let's like, you know, I'll, I'll go back and watch this when I'm writing it. So hi, Colin, in like yeah. two years, you know, um, <laughs> the, it's a really interesting feature that um, when you if you read the ancient Greek philosophers, they talk a lot about human excellence and uh, and and at the highest point of human excellence for Aristotle, you see friendship and the Greek term there is philia. And that's as good as human life can get from his perspective. And, uh, you know, what you, what you don't have is God paying any attention to humanity. So I, I, I hope your listeners can recognize, like, Aristotle actually talks about God. He talks about friendship with God. He talks about whether or not he or his friend should become God or, or like how much they could become like God. And his conclusions are, are, when he comes to conclusions, he says things like, well, first we got to think about what God is. And God is like thought thinking itself, right? It's like, it's like a mind contemplating its own excellence. So it's sort of inwardly focused necessarily because there's nothing greater than it. So it's not a bad inward focus. It's a, like God would want to spend God's time focusing on the best thing that could possibly exist. And that's God. And so, you know, that's why God is doing that, which is, why humans look to God, right? Because we think we, and we know God is sort of more perfect than we are. Can, should I want my friend to become God? Should I want to be God? Well, he says, you know, gods are so different than humans that we just can't do it. So we're not going to be able to become like God. And, um, your friend's not gonna be able to come like God. You shouldn't want for things that, that can't happen. So you got to just kind of cut it out. Just don't, don't want it. Um, but you should live as like God as you can. So you should try to be as excellent as you can, but uh, know that, that there's a certain cap and mm. that cap ultimately is going to be like you and your friend living together, talking about the best things, which is like God, you know? Okay. Um, okay. Now, now think about this. God is interested in God's self and might have a certain friendship with God's self. And I'm supposed to have friendship with my friends, but we're not going to become like God. So that barrier is so clear, like there's no crossing this barrier, right? And the the in, the radical claim of Christianity is summarized so well. It's like you know, I go get all this education stuff, and then I come back to Hot Dog Church, and they show me like the little two cliff edges and the little cross, yep, you know, that fits in, and like that's how you get to God, man. It's like that is the truth. That is like that's just like a good summary of my dissertation. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Is that in the end, God loves us and and chooses us and chooses to bring us to him and chooses to bring our friends to him. And we can continue being in a relationship with our friends in God. And that actually begins here and now by turning to love God and trusting God with our friends rather than trusting ourselves and our wisdom and our medical technology and our whatever, our money. It's just, uh, you know, so... When you read Traherne, you know, one way of trying to think about this work is like, it's like the brilliance of Aristotle, the clear thinking that, the, you know, when I think of Aristotle, I just think of like drinking from like a mountain spring. It's just clear and fresh and it's, you know, no nonsense, completely unpolluted. And yet, um, you know, even the mountain spring can't take me to the stars, baby. And so here you got Thomas Traherne and he's like mountain spring and rocket fuel. And we're, you know, he's like, he's helping you think through that virtue ethics tradition, which can really love your life and being a human and thinking about human excellence. And how can your life just be like as awesome as possible? How can you just really flourish 
and and even anyone anytime you've ever heard someone use the term flourishing or whatever in like your you know evangelical pop psychology or whatever yeah i cringe they're stealing this flourish but they're stealing it from aristotle it's like that's where it comes from is that that you know for humans to be happy is for them to to flourish to grow to fulfill their natures yes and Traherne is saying but your nature is not quite fulfilled aristotle Mm. it's not fulfilled until you've got christ because christ is is the final um you know, like cherry on top that, that can give you everything that you wanted, everything that you've right. been working for, everything that you know, and you can articulate with your mind, but you can't figure out how you could ever get there because you and your friend, no matter how smart you are, can't figure out how to be God. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that's good stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, I love that. Uh, he pulls on Aristotle so much and it, for someone like me, I had, to, I had to read a lot of this classical work in high school. I've neglected to read anything since particularly on Aristotle. If someone were to want to read Aristotle, what's what's a good place to start? And I'm saying if someone, if I, if I wanted to read Aristotle, what would be a good work to just go to? And because uh, you talked about being really refreshing and being really enjoyable to read him, clear thinking, uh, what would you recommend? I mean, you can get the basic works of Aristotle for very cheap on Amazon. And, you know, then you'll have it on your shelf if you ever want to go back. And it's got most of what you want. I, you know, the Nicomachean Ethics is the the clearest and the simplest and probably the most famous work that Aristotle wrote. I know because I teach it on a regular basis that the average American does not find it clear and refreshing in the way that I do. But um, sure. so you might want to consider taking a class or something. I teach uh, classes on Aristotle every spring at Davenant Hall. So oh, you cool. can go to davenanthall.com and we always have at least one class that's just on Aristotle every, every year. That's great. Um, and there's, you know, there, you can find other people that are doing similar work. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, I'll put a link to the show notes for you listeners out there uh, to that work on Amazon. Uh, kind of one of my last questions I had, you know, when I think about the modern church, there seems to be a kind of a, especially in the American context, when we like, we're going to teach a sermon series coming up, uh, depending on when you're listening to this, it's coming up um, on kind of like, uh, we're titling it Dominion from Genesis 126. And what does it look like for humans to live out their calling to have dominion? And we're going through various aspects of ethics and virtue and relationships and that kind of thing. And we're trying to be very faithful to the scripture, uh, paint it in stark contrast to kind of the world's ways. But a lot of times when I'm researching these type of topics for sermons, what I find in a lot of kind of pop psychology evangelicalism is almost like glorified TED Talks you know, and like pithy statements about uh, a husband and wife, for example, we're going to talk about marriage. And so you'll get stupid slogans like uh, happy wife, happy life. And, you know, they try to put that into the Bible. And, and so there's just a lot of ethical teaching, moral teaching, trying to help people live an excellent life, so to speak. But it gets reduced to kind of pithiness. And uh, it's, it's not grounded and something greater or a vision for something greater, a pursuit of excellence. It's more grounded in what's useful and how like, cause I mean, honestly, if, if we can be honest, a lot of people are looking for that usefulness today. They're looking for my marriage is falling apart. How do I just keep it together? My kids are acting up. How do you know, what do I need to do here? And they're looking and, for And tips. the pastor's thinking the same way, right? Cause they're thinking like, how do I keep butts in the seats? How do I keep <laughs> sure? Yeah. Even if you're not trying to actively think in those terms, you can't help it. Right. Yeah. This is like, it's human nature. It. Yeah. Yeah. So how would Traherne's approach to ethics and these topics maybe differ from a lot of what we see today with uh, with kind of Ted talky sermons, if that makes sense? Yeah. You know, I mean, he was he was just a true philosopher uh, in that he was delightfully useless. And I think <laughs> I think we need I we need like another upsurgence of people recognizing the the joy of uselessness and just like don't try to maximize stuff you know just just hang out because tomorrow you know we're gonna die and uh i you know i like he, he lived it out he he had very little money um he he had so little money that on his deathbed he could just like dictate he's like oh yeah give my brother my favorite hat you know and they're like anything else like that's it you know and oh yeah i guess that walking stick too um you know i i think like we we tend to think we're, we're very informed by this utilitarian form of thinking right and um and 
and utilitarian forms of thinking can be really valuable. Like if you have a, if you have a limited budget and you have to figure out like, how should we allocate the budget? Thinking about what the money's going to do if I put it here rather than there, like how do I maximize the impact of the whatever? There's lots of places in our lives, and I will submit that they are the most important places in our lives where that form of thinking is completely misplaced mm -hmm. and counterproductive. And if I want to figure out how do I have a good relationship with my wife, thinking about the maximization of the utilization of resources is a pretty good way to ensure that we end up divorced <laughs> because you're like, you're, you're treating this person who's a whole human being um, with an inner world and with like particular thoughts and problems as if they're, you know, uh, a cog in a machine or, or like a project to get done. And, um, you know, certainly you're going to have projects to get done around your house. You've got a limited amount of time, but recognizing like, even just like we, we understand this when it comes to retirement, I, I think, which is really where if I could take one modern analogy and then try to like use it and squeeze it and get people to recognize its relationship to other things. I would submit that most of your listeners are probably working so that someday they can retire. They're socking away a little bit into the stock market. They're buying some land, you know, they're, they're Bitcoin maxing. Who knows? I don't know what they do. Sure. Um, but, but like that is a recognition that the point of the useful life of your work is oriented towards something more important, more valuable, more fun, which is the useless life that ultimately what I want to do is like store up these useful credits so I can spend them on uselessness and leisure. And if you recognize that, then what, then, then you can apply it to other places and say like, oh yeah, okay. So I have to like do chores around the house or whatever, but I'm doing all these things so that I can get to that hour that I can just sit with my wife. We can just be together, which was the point of getting married in the first right. place. I can just sit with my kids. My kids aren't a project. I'm not trying to maximize my kids. Right. I might be trying to maximize how many kids I can sure. have afford, but I'm not trying to maximize the child. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and so, um, those, those relationships, I think it's really valuable to sort of let leisure, let uselessness into those spaces. Uh, I, I think also for, for oneself, like let find ways to like carve out those little bits of retirement, you know, in the uselessness and just leisure and really, you know, we'll just, let's just go there, man. Like that's part of what the Sabbath is supposed right. to be about. It's like. And, you know, I get that that's really hard if you're a pastor because you like your work and your day of rest are sort of one yeah. and the same in a sure. certain sense. But but certainly if you're a congregant, you know, what can I do to show up here and like, like relax and take joy in the created existence that I get to dwell inside of and yeah. like the beauty of, you know, being in the presence of God, which I am all the time. But now I'm going to set aside some time to just like just you know, grin at yep. it. Um, and that's, I mean, that's something that Treherne was really good at. And it comes through on every page of his writing. I mean, this dude, he understands reality and relationship to God. We, you know, evangelicals talk a lot about my personal relationship with God, your relationship to God. Treherne is like, no, 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 no. Everything has a relationship mm. to God. And we are the, the unique material beings who get to be aware of that. And that can just give you just like endless bursts of joy as you move from like thing to thing in your life. If you can actually sit there yep. with it, which it is, is hard. Really hard. So I, I encourage readers, if you dig this, but you don't want to go out and buy a book, I'm, I'm writing little introductions to some of his most famous poems and posting them up on the Ad Fontes website. And you can get a, just get a sense of like how he thinks about reality, you know? And you can see, I think when you get into it, you can see the images that, that C.S. Lewis kind of steals and puts into like the space trilogy, for example, when, when, when Ransom lands on Paralandra and like, he's like touching the bubble tree and it like bursts and he's like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's the good stuff. He's, he's definitely drawing on track. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. I've always said, um, and I know it's, I'm going to say a couple things that hopefully won't get me in trouble. Um, when I preach we used to get in trouble because there wasn't a lot of practical application at the end of the sermon, like do these three steps, you know, and that's, you mm -hmm. know, the Puritans were actually really good about that. Most, a lot of, they had a lot of practical preaching. And so I've tried to grow in that yet at the same time, I'll never lose this kind of sense of like, 
Yeah, but I'm on the Sabbath and when I'm when we're leading a worship service and I'm preaching the word, my main aim isn't for you to become a more useful person. You know, like that's mm -hmm. that is like, yeah, like I want to I want you to live an excellent life, but I want you to delight in God, marvel at his beauty, delight in the relationships you've had. The other thing is that I have uh, I have guys that work either night shift or they struggle with insomnia at my church. And so I'll look out sometimes and granted, my preaching isn't that, you know, charismatic necessarily, uh, but I'll see them sleeping during church, you know. And I think a yeah. lot of I, growing up in the Baptist church that like that was like a big no, no, you know, you got to. But to me, when I see them sleeping, I kind of like chuckle to myself. It's because they're yeah. like they're getting rest like and I'm not I'm not advocating yeah. that they take. I'm not saying you should take a nap during church. But man, like don't bring a pillow. <laughs> but if it happens, if it happens, it happens like it's as if you're at home and your dad's reading you a story and telling you good things. And you can finally take a breath. And I'm like, that's beautiful. Now, of course, I want you to know more about God. So wake up, you know, but like, like, I mm -hmm. want people to have a vision for the Christian life. That's much more than just, well, I go to this church because they're inter they entertain me and, uh, and they get my emotions stirred. Uh, I want, of course, I want people to have an emotional experience with the Lord, but it's just so much more than that. And there's such deeper satisfaction in kind of this vision for Sabbath rest being in relationship with other Christians and being, so to speak, useless, uh, not useless in a negative way necessarily, but just at peace and able to reflect and delight in one another's company, not having an agenda every meeting or, or something like that. Uh, we live in such a high paced world where we've always got to be accomplishing something. And my friends know me like when we're in meeting, it's like, why are we meeting? What do we need to get done? Let's make the decision. And when are we going to do it? That's great. But like, Absolutely. that can be, but but if you're if you're sitting down with people that you just want to like you just wanted to hang out with and you're like finally you get it till a chance to just like yep. hang out that's a different totally. experience you know you're not trying to get anything done if, and and if somebody's sort of like intrusive like we got to really get some stuff right. done it's like oh my gosh you're harshing the the vibe man this is not <laughs> this is not we were just we were just enjoying yeah. each other yeah and think about how how hard it is for us to even be silent in one another's imagine getting to heaven and being like god I'm sorry. We just got to interrupt this. Uh, we got to get some stuff yeah, done. No. <laughs> just... This is actually one of the things that drives my wife crazy is, is that you find these, have you ever heard the song? Uh, you never stop working. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. Oh God, you never stop. I don't even know how to sing it. Yeah. But like any, all these songs or, you know, it's like, or, the, or and it comes with, uh, you know, God, God's, God's always changing. It's like all of this. It's like, no, he never works. And he doesn't change. <laughs> like, you've missed understood i mean of course with god right uniquely he's the one being for whom work and rest are not yeah. at odds and so yeah i get it he's he's pure act i mean it's like i've read my thomas aquinas and i can i can do this but you miss something if you sort of have the strong emphasis on his work yeah um that he's trying to tell you in genesis one it's like <laughs> it's right there yeah i think it's the uh you never stop you never stop working uh it's a very catchy very catchy tune but yeah it, it can lead to a lot of I think in, in churches for, for a lot of Christians, it can lead to a lot of pressure uh, and a reflection, uh, uh, an understanding of God where it's like, it's very demanding, you know, and very active and that's great, but it produces a church culture and, that's and maybe that way. In, in, maybe in some cultures, you know, there might be like, I'm willing to entertain that. Like, I don't know, you know, I'm probably going to piss off the listeners, but like, maybe there's like the, in like a lazy Irish community in like rural Ireland, they need to, you know, to <laughs> sing this song about how God never stops working or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but like, you know, maybe in the average American, you know, uh, hardworking entrepreneurial, like these are not the people you got to be singing this <laughs> right. song to. Okay. This is going to kill them. They're going to have heart attacks here. It's like, these people need to take them. They need to like, they're all on anxiety yeah. medicine, okay? They're on they're on Prozac because they're working so damn hard. <laughs> so lazy Irish community. Oh man, that's good stuff. Well, Colin, this was really fun. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Where can people pick up uh, this great work, Christian Ethics? Uh, buy, you know, get it on Amazon. I think it's like $14. Uh, you know, you can find it obviously if you scroll around on the Davin Institute website, but the easiest way is just go to Amazon. And uh, if you do that, you know, you'll be supporting the work of the Davin Institute. We'd, we'd love to have you rate and review it. Five star reviews only. I also give one to my boy Chase over <laughs> here. OK, at the Full Proof podcast. Appreciate this guy. I'm coming back. That's great. You're going to be, be the only one to come back three times. I'm looking forward to it. Three episodes. <laughs> Man, thanks so much for coming on the show today. 
Yeah, no, really good to, good to be here. Good to see you again. Hey, if you're a listener and you enjoyed this, do what Colin said. Give it a great rating. Uh, share it with a friend. Pick up the work. Really do. Um, it's it's digestible. It's easy to read. He respects your time. And uh, I think I think it would be really good just material for, for you to get familiar with some, some we can call it ancient, I suppose, literature uh, that's going to help you become a more excellent person and, and really enjoy the beauty of life and enjoy God more. So pick it up. Leave a great rating. Subscribe if you're on YouTube. And I think you have to hit some kind of bell. At least that's what all the YouTubers that my kids watch. They hit the bell icon. You got to to get notified of when I drop a new episode. It's, 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 it's right, right here. here. <laughs> right? <laughs> is, it, is it over there? I thought it was here. Thanks so much for joining me for Full Proof Theology. We will see you next time. <laughs>